me introduce uh, Sebastian Dobson, our uh, speaker tonight. So he is introducing this lavishly illustrated uh, volume of early photographs of Japan, and I'll leave it to him to talk about that. But uh, Sebastian is an independent scholar and a dealer in photographs um, based here in the UK, uh, and he specialises in early photographs from East Asia uh, in general and Japan more particularly, and this is obviously about Japan um, today. Um, and as well as dealing in photographs, he uh, writes uh, about uh, these early photographs and produces essays for catalogues and, and so on. So um, I've had a brief look at the book, and it's full of fantastic stuff, but I won't talk about it because that's what Sebastian's here to do. So I'll pass over to you, Sebastian. Um, thank you very much, uh, J um, J uh, Jason. Um, I, I hope you can hear me. Um, I also hope you can um, read the slides. Um, as I was, as I was um, creating this presentation, I used a font size which was a bit too small, so um, Izzy Morley has very heroically been going through and trying to enlarge them, so uh, um, hopefully you will be able to see the images in context. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Jason uh, James and the team at the Taiwan Anglo Japanese Foundation for hosting tonight's event and for uh, Thames and Hudson uh, for sending Brando uh, along. He is waiting downstairs to sell you copies of um, the book at the, uh, the special price of £35 um, tonight, um, whilst stops last, the ideal Christmas gift. <laughs> says here. Um, I'd also like to welcome um, Peter and Ruth uh, Raufalara from Lydion, the publisher of this book, who have come tonight from Brussels. And um, it is wonderful to see you both. And I owe you both a debt of thanks as the supervising editors of this project, um, who had to work with a, a, a writer who um, missed not one but two deadlines and exceeded the word limit not once but twice at the last count. And so thank you both for your, um, your patient but occasionally um, ruthless guidance <laughs> during this project. Um, so the book showcases a wonderful collection of um, photographs um, taken in Japan in the late 19th century. What we would call Yokohama photographs or Yokohama uh, Shashin, though Yokohama is not, uh, the, entire, is not the entirety of this, of this story. And um, I'd like to start, I'm going to put my dealer hat on here, drawn a complete blank. They'll probably appear in a minute, yeah. There it is. Um, uh, this is. This is the one that got away. As a dealer, I'm often asked, um, is there an image which you regret selling? And over the years, over 25 years of buying and selling these photographs, um, there are some I've been reluctant to sell, but I've accepted the fact that they found a good home. Um, other times, those photographs you're quite happy to see the back of, quite honestly, but um, there is one photograph which I do regret having sold, and it's, it is this one. Um, if we go back to San Francisco 2000, I visited a uh, dealer who had a job lot of Yokohama photographs and it's an interesting genre, um, but uh, it can get rather repetitive. And in this group of photographs, all about A4 size, printed on albumin paper, um, hand coloured, beautifully hand coloured in this case, one image in particular jumped out and as a courtesy I bought it. And I was, I was drawn to it because um, enactment staging is very much the stock in trade with uh, Yokohama photography. And yet there was something about this one which suggested more than just your typical staging. Um, you had the sense really of looking in on some kind of illicit meeting between this, this geisha who is holding her hand against a post, almost sort of holding us off, while behind the two lanterns sits a patron who is, you can make out his, his pipe, um, you can make out his ear, he has a western style haircut, otherwise he's dressed in Japanese style. And it was just the way it was constructed, as if we were watching something illicit. And I liked the image, um, but I, I sold it a year later, too quickly. 
and I never saw it again. And I regretted doing so then, and I regret doing so now um, even more for reasons which I will explain in the course of this lecture. So, Yokohama photography. Um, we're pretty much, there is a consensus about where uh, Yokohama photography begins, when, uh, I should say, Yokohama photography begins, and that is in the early 1860s. Um, conventional wisdom has it that um, we can date it fairly certain, uh, fairly um, with, with a degree of certainty to 1862-1863, when you have this convergence of photographic talent in the newly opened treaty port of Yokohama. And um, two individuals in particular, Shimoka Renjo, homegrown talent, um, and the charismatic figure of Felice Beato, who arrives in 1863. He's a, a photographer with an incredible track record, having worked in the Crimea, in um, the Indian Mutiny. His most, recent, um, his most recent venture was in China during the Opium War, and then he fetches up in Yokohama. And he starts to produce um, portfolios of um, landscapes, uh, but also of um, genre studies, um, showing um, what he described as um, the costumes of the people. And he establishes the classic vocabulary of the Yokohama Shechin, of um, hand-coloured albumen prints. Um, again, we're looking at something slightly bigger than A4 size, pasted into an album, and um, Beato introduced text as well, uh, separately printed paper captions which were pasted on the, um, on the, other, on the other side of the, um, of, of the fold-out. So you've got this sort of balance, an explanatory text and an image. Um, for the rest of the century, this is what most Japanese studios are producing, this, this sort of um, illustrated guide to, to Japan. And um, Biato is very good. He commodifies this extremely successfully. Um, I can't resist showing this, this caricature of Biato in the British uh, Museum, um, which um, was produced by his friend, uh, Charles Workman, the, um, the artist. And uh, in this case, it's a caricature from uh, the... Um, I think it was intended for the satirical journal Japan Punch. And um, here, Workman shows his friend, Beato. And Beato is um, in typical mode. It's always business with Beato, although he was a, a, an incredibly good photographer. He was also a, 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 um, a businessman, even a huckster to, to, to his fingertips. And here he is, he's sort of asking, talking to someone off, off screen, saying, uh, you gagne de l'argent, you fait des affaires, he, he makes money, he, he does business. And um, Beato is also always chasing uh, business opportunities. And um, thanks to him, I think Yokohama Photography gets, um, gets a, a, it's kick-started. And it continues into the 1870s. Um, Beato goes off in search of other business ventures um, and steadily withdraws from Yokohama Photography. The baton then passes to, there are other Japanese photographers, but um, a, a figure who dominates the, the local photographic scene um, during the 1870s is um, the Austro-Hungarian aristocrat uh, Baron Raimund von Stilfried. And here we see him as, I think, um, a lot of foreign photographers in Japan liked to imagine themselves. Uh, you see here um, Stilfried shown with his cameras, and there's a pretty extensive array of equipment here, uh, a mammoth plate camera, a uh, stereoscopic uh, camera, uh, various sizes of negative. You have to remember, of course, that you're printing, that images at that time were printed on glass, and a print was uh, a, a direct, it was taken directly from glass. So you're working in various formats, juggling uh, <coughs> different sizes. And yet, Stilfried seems determined to show us that he is an artist, and we can see him here with, um, in front of an easel with a brush and palette in his hand, uh, putting the finishing touches to what seems to be a self-portrait. And seated, the final accessory seems to be a Japanese assistant who is uh, kneeling at his feet. Um, and Stilfried was no doubt tickled to have this sort of accessory of one of his um, assistants sort of providing this sort of this, this wonderful touch. But I've always been intrigued 
um, by the figure and especially the expression on his face, because uh, sadly it's not a very good uh, copy of this image, but um, his gaze is not directed up towards Stilfried in, in adoration and admiration. It's, gaze, it's directed very much towards the camera equipment, and um, he's obviously waiting for his chance to um, learn enough about photography from Stilfried and then set up on his own which is very much the trage trajectory of um, Japanese photography thereafter, uh, uh, in the late 1870s, into the late 1880s, and steadily, steadily uh, foreign photographers are squeezed out, and Japanese-run studios um, come to dominate. Uh, certainly by uh, 1890, uh, there is only one foreign-operated studio left in Yokohama, and in that same year, its owner returns to his native Italy. Um, this is not Beato, this is uh, another fascinating individual called Aldolfo Fassari, who um, I, I talk about in the book at some length. So, the end of Yokohama photography is perhaps less uh, easy to pin down as, uh, than its beginning. Um, conventional wisdom has it that um, it ends, three factors basically converge in the 1890s. Um, the first is the, um, the growing trend of amateur photography, um, facilitated by the development of uh, roll film, the Kodak. Um, tourists can now take their own, visitors to Japan can now take their own photographs. So you don't need to go to a, a photo studio in order to buy views of Japan, because you can go out and take them when you're on the road. And um, this is acknowledged by a lot of studios that find that a lot of the time they are not selling photographs, they're actually um, offering the use of a dark room and actually printing people's photographs for them rather than selling their own. Um, the other two factors are, they are connected, and that is um, the technological um, advance of uh, photomechanical printing. Uh, which means that uh, photographs can be reproduced a lot more quickly and in combination with text. And this is manifest in the postcard, the picture postcard. Um, in 1900, the Japanese government authorized the sale of uh, photographs. Not, not I mean, up until then, postcards were simple pieces of card with space left for um, an address and a message and a way of space for uh, putting your stamp on. Then in 1900, you were allowed to buy um, printed postcards, and it was possible to buy postcard images of photographs, um, which were a lot cheaper. You could easily put an album together at a fraction of the cost of putting together an album of al al album and print uh, photographs. Um, connected to um, photomechanical printing is the third um, element, which is um, the, um, the photo book. Photomechanical printing enables you to print images along with text. And so, um, from about 18, the late 1880s, um, Japanese printers are starting to produce um, these rather beautiful photo books. It's a, a precursor of the photo book, what we would recognize as the photo book today, um, which are mostly produced for foreign consumption. Um, to some extent, they are a little touristic, but you have the, the mixture of text and image. Um, the image I showed you earlier of a Beato album is incredibly laborious. Text has to be printed separately on the label and then pasted in. The, the photograph has to be printed separately and pasted in. Um, with a colorside book, you can get text and image together, often on the same page. And uh, again, the, cost, the costs are lower and the quality is better. In fact, the image does not fade, unlike a photograph, if it's exposed to the light for too long. So those factors are generally um, put forward as representing the the end of Yokohama photography, um, which certainly um, there is a lot to be said for that, that interpretation. Um, however, I would like to put forward um, the career of an individual as um, an alternative um, an alternative view of this this the, the end of, of um, Yokohama photography. I'm just waiting for the image to um, appear on the screen. And this, in, this individual is Kajima Sebe, who um, is a fascinating figure. You don't seem to have it. I'll just... Um, Kajima Sebe, yes, I must be pressing too hard. Um, 
He is a figure that appears in the history of Japanese photography rather like a meteor from about 1890 up until the end of that decade. He just flashes across the uh, photographic community. Um, he is incredibly active. He does so much. Um, he's, he's, he's received recent appreciation. There was an exhibition of, well, there was an exhibition about him held at Fuji Film Square in Tokyo in 2019. And um, it was, a, in some ways, it presented Kajima, the man, uh, very well. Um, it didn't really present his photographs. You've got very little idea of what he actually produced. And uh, it was rather the, it was, a, it, it gave you a taste, a, a foretaste, but didn't really uh, give you a full, uh, uh, the complete flavor of, of Kajima as a photographer. Um, most recently, Kajima has had a walk-on part in a best-selling novel, uh, Samana Toko's book, Hoshiyoshite uh, Nao, which received the Naoki Prize in 2021. A historical novel based on the life of the artist um, Kawanabe Kyosai, um, a very eccentric individual, and Kajima Seibe was actually part of his circle. And um, that already gives you perhaps an idea of how special Kajima Seibe is. Um, the, in the history, the early history of uh, Japanese photography, um, the normal uh, narrative for the first, the very first Japanese photographers is one of overcoming, um, overcoming the odds. It's, it's a struggle. Um, overcoming, um, mastering a foreign technology, overcoming poverty, parental opposition, um, often having to sort of go to extraordinary lengths in order to learn the technology and then master it. Uh, there are false starts, there are occasional dead ends, but it's always this sort of heroic overcoming of the odds. Um, Kajima is the next generation, and Kajima seems to achieve almost the opposite, in that he starts off with um, tremendous advantages of, of wealth, and um, um, I've, I, I'll talk about his wealth later, but of wealth, um, status, and connections, and yet, one way or another, he manages to overcome these advantages and spend most of his life in extreme poverty, uh, bankrupted, it seems, by photography. <coughs> so, um, I've put together a handout which gives you some highlights from Kajima's life. Um, this is just to... I, there's only so much I can cover this evening, so um, I, 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 I hope you'll enjoy reading this later. I think it gives you more of, uh, gives you more idea of um, what he accomplished uh, during during the that short time when he was active as a photographer. Um, this is the young Kajima, and this may well be the he may well be the, the first Japanese photographer for whom we have a baby portrait. Uh, this was taken around about 1870, and when he was, uh, I'm very bad at aging, guessing the age of children, but um, it's probably when he was about three or four, and um, you can already see from, well, the fact he was photographed for a start at that time uh, suggests that he came from a fairly uh, wealthy background. Um, the fact that he is so ornately dressed, again, sort of um, indicates that this is not your typical baby portrait from this time. And he comes from a family of sake distributors. And um, this was a family business which went back to the 17th century. And at, at that time, the distribution of sake was a government monopoly, which was farmed out to various, um, to various uh, corporations. And the Kajimaya Corporation secured one contract, which made them extremely wealthy. And um, their main branch was located in Tokyo. Um, Sebe, or as we should call him Senosuke at that time, was born into the Osaka branch, um, but was adopted in, as, head of the, um, as head of the Tokyo branch um, because they failed to produce a male heir. So he was adopted about the age of, um, uh, about the age of five, and then formally, uh, it was formalized when he, he married into the family. Um, and um, by the um, by the age of 20, and we're talking about 1886, he was um, in possession of a great fortune, and he was working out various ways to spend it. Um, one way was um, he had a great interest in traditional Japanese arts. Um, he was a great follower of the Noh Theatre. 
he also loved uh, kabuki theatre. He was fascinated by lacquer work. He apparently studied lacquer making for a time, um, then decided it wasn't for him. And um, through that accidental uh, combination of circumstances, which you read about in many biographies of Japanese photographers from this time, he found a camera, started fiddling with it, and decided that, yes, photography might be the thing for him. And so he apprenticed himself at his own expense to a Tokyo-based photographer and um, started mastering the process. Um, when I say this, he was extremely wealthy. Um, well, firstly, if we fast forward to 1963, um, by which time, of course, um, uh, Kashima Seve has been, has been dead for, 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 more than 30, for almost 30 years, um, a construction crew um, preparing ground on the former Kajima residence in central Tokyo um, were digging up the foundations of an old building which had belonged to him and they found a hoard of gold coins, gold coins from the Edo period, uh, Koban, um, various denominations. Um, it turned out to be almost 80,000 of them, and which uh, in 1963 had, um, I did try to do a calculation, and I think the value in 1963 was 600,000 yen, which doesn't sound like very much. Um, if you do the calculation, I'm sorry, six, I'm always bad with Japanese numbers, but yes, it was calculated about six, 600,000 yen back in 1963. In contemporary value, it would be, in yen, it would be 60 million yen. Oh, I'm sorry, it would be uh, 1 billion yen. I got, uh, again, I told you I'm bad with numbers. So yes, um, the value in 1963 was 60 million yen. Uh, today's value would be 1 billion yen, or as we might say in Britain, um, almost 6 million pounds. And this was just lying, well, it was buried uh, in the garden of the Kajima residence, and its absence wasn't really noted at the time, so that gives you an idea of the kind of money which he has. And Kajima quickly establishes himself as, and this seems to be a self, um, a self uh, appointed nickname, he establishes himself as the, the Shashin Daijin, uh, which is often translated as either the millionaire photographer or the magnate of photography. However, I'd like to remind you uh, that the word daijin has two different meanings, one of which is millionaire or magnate, and the other is big spender, or even worse, a debauchee. And certainly Kajima steered very close to debauchery in his uh, enjoyment of his, of his fortune. So after a period of, of study, um, he starts bankrolling various photographic projects. He helps to set up a... Um, uh, company manufacturing uh, dry plate negatives. And this is the beginning of a connection between uh, Kajima and um, new photographic technology, which um, never goes away. Um, then he's a shadowy figure in the establishment of the first photographic society in Japan, the uh, Nihon Shashin Kyokai, which is established in uh, 1889. Um, again, his role seems to be that of a sponsor, and a very generous one. And um, here we see him, in his element, hosting a meeting of the, um, the Photographic Society of Japan in, in, in his residence. Uh, not the main residence in Shinkawa, but the one in uh, uh, Mokojima, just across the Sumida River. He had several residences. And uh, here they're having a, what seems to be a satsuekai, and uh, Kajima has provided uh, music as well. And here he is, uh, seated. He seems to be beating the drum, uh, beating the drum for photography. And possibly as well for, for, for his, his own reputation, um, but very much in his element. Um, and another thing to note is that this is not just a, an organization for Japanese photographers. There are quite a few foreign photographers, foreign residents, who are interested in photography as amateurs. And um, so, yes, here we have him. Um, he is in his element, and he presents himself as not just a millionaire photographer, but as very much um, a, what's the word, not quite a dilettante, but an amateur in the true sense of the word. And um, his obsession with equipment leads him to make purchases from various camera <coughs> manufacturers, mostly in Britain, and um, he's trying out various sizes. Um, I'm afraid this is a terrible half-tone reproduction, but um, it gives you an idea of 
well, it gives you an idea of his wealth. Um, Kajimo is sitting in the centre of this group, surrounded by cameras and staff. Um, the, the author of this is from a, a, a potted biography of uh, Kajima by, by one of his friends. Um, the author of this article wrote that whenever I look at this photograph, I challenge myself to count all the cameras and I never get the same answer twice. Um, it's almost the same with looking at the assistants because one is never sure who is an assistant and who is just a hanger on. But uh, Kajima seemed to be able to sort of employ people to do, do things for him. So not only did he have an orchestra, um, on call to provide entertainment when these photographic, um, these satsue kai were taking place um, at his um, at his residence, but he also had um, a lot of assistants. Mm -hmm. So, um, as I say, he's closely involved with um, the first photographic society in Japan. Then he starts to break cover in 1894. He's um, his Photographic activities become more public. He starts advertising the fact that he is going on a photographic tour um, of the Mount Fuji region and taking um, mammoth clay photographs. And um, the result of one expedition is this large um, this image, uh, which uh, is of Mount Fuji, which he presented to the imperial household. Just to give you an idea of scale, if we start in the top left-hand corner, this is the image which started my connection <coughs> with Kajima. Um, if you imagine it's A4 size or thereabouts. Um, at the bottom, we have the image which he presented to the imperial household from his expedition to Mount Fuji. Um, the image above is the actual size, um, which is pretty big. You, you can imagine you're taking glass plates this size out to Mount Fuji with chemicals, with a darkroom tent, um, because you usually have to develop them on site. And um, well, it's not a problem because he's got a lot of money and a lot of people working for him. Uh, and this is an enlargement which he presented to the imperial household as a uh, gift to mark the silver wedding anniversary of the Emperor Meiji. So it's, um, he's showing off, but he's also, this is, there's a gesture here as a, as a, a, a loyal subject of, of, of the emperor. Um, he's very, um, very keen on self-promotion, is Kajima. And... Um, he breaks cover in 1895, and um, in February 1895, he sets up a studio. So for a long time he's pretending that he's just an amateur, or he likes to support project, he's a sponsor. Um, but then in February 1895, um, a studio called the Gen Rokukan is unveiled in central Tokyo, in, in the Ginza area, in uh, what was called Kobikicho. And... Um, it's advertised in English and Japanese, and um, it's quite impressive because it's not just it's not just a, um, a photo studio in the conventional sense. Um, perhaps if I just quickly fast forward, this is what we are looking at. Um, this is a three-story building in central Tokyo, occupying prime real estate, um, and um, it had a, a telephone connection. I, it even had uh, an elevator. Um, and this is 1895. Um, but this building contains several departments, and um, it lists the departments here. Um, so there is a studio department where you can have portraits taken. Um, during the evenings, he's, uh, he's mastered flash photography. Uh, he can do nighttime photography, um, not just with a flash, but with very powerful arc lights. Um, a printing department, which will print your photographs um, on any kind of paper. A photomechanical department, where books are being printed. A um, photoscientific department, which is devoted to the production of micro photographs and uh, telephotographs, etc., etc. Um, Kajima is showing off the latest photographic technology. And uh, the fifth department is called the show department, which was a sort of an exhibition gallery where. Um, Photographers could exhibit their work, and I think this was a nod towards the Photographic Society of Japan, which he was still lavishly bankrolling. So, yes, in this, um, this building, um, there's something very new, very different happening. Um, the building itself represents modern Japan. Um, it later became a hospital. Um, it was big enough to become a hospital. And... Uh, it's um, perhaps typical of the modern style of the, the sort of this, this interesting uh, amalgamation of styles uh, from the of Japanese and this sort of Japanese and 
almost Italian style of, of building. Um, but at the same time, it looks firmly backwards, in, the, in or at least it harkens back to uh, traditional uh, Chinese-derived culture in its name, the, the Gen Rokukan. Uh, Gen Roku is the, um, the animal companion of one of the uh, gods, the seven gods of, of fortune, um, Jurogen, um, rather charmingly translated as the old man of the South Pole, who is often shown with, um, with Gen Roku. So it's, um, I guess, a literal translation of Gen Rokukan would be the hall of the, st the stag of longevity. And um, you can see that the, the stag mark appears, is very closely connected with, it becomes, in effect, Kajima's brand. Um, here, there's an advertisement which um, he uh, issued in, just in time for um, the Kyoto Industrial Exhibition of 1895, which, although he has an agent, Okamoto, um, Kajima Sebe appears further down, described as uh, president of the Genrokukan, and um, the text, which I think Kajima wrote himself, um, talks about um, Kajima being the king of amateur photographers, uh, having received the unqualified praise of various European photographic periodicals. He's, um, he also, and this is a rather dubious claim, but he implies that he has um, not just thousands of images in stock, but um, uh, tens if not hundreds of thousands of images, uh, which is a, a rather dubious claim. Um, Despite this sort of blatant commercial activity, um, Kajima continues to identify himself as an amateur. This is a very rare, this is an, an item from the, the Kurokawa collection, <coughs> in which this book is, 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 has, has been written. And um, he presented himself, as you can see, it's sort of exclusively in, in uh, English text, um, with, again, the, um, the stag's head motif. And, of course, the stag's head... Uh, it took me a long time to work this out, is derived from uh, his family name, Kajima, of course, uh, mm. the, the Roku or Shika. And, um, but he, it's difficult to read because the text is so ornate, but you have his name, S. Kajima, and then uh, what might be a reproduction of his signature, but then the ornate text across the top reads, Amateur Photographer, and um, he holds on to this uh, identity um, relentlessly, despite the fact that he is running the Genrokukan. There is a fiction put forward that um, the Genroku Khan is managed by his brother, who is called Kajima Seisaburo, another S. Kajima. Um, however, in a visit to the Japan Society upstairs this afternoon, I was able to verify that uh, his brother was not even living in Tokyo at this time, but was actually living here in London, and was um, partying with the likes of Frederick Lord Leighton and organising conversazione for the art circle of the Japan Society. So it was very much his older brother's show. Um, so Kajima is running a studio. Um, it is a commercial studio, but he is doing it very much for his own amusement. And so he basically photographs um, what interests him most. And what interests him most brings us back to this image, which I was so sorry to see the back of in 2001. And um, it's... Well, it's, it's a self-portrait. It is Kajima, uh, with his mistress, the geisha Ponta. Ponta can be quite easily identified because um, she was, at this time, possibly, in fact, almost certainly, the, the most photographed woman in Japan, appearing <coughs> in his work, which he was selling uh, to, um, well, selling to foreign visitors, but also her image was circulating elsewhere in Japan. She was being used to advertise beer. In fact, it was in the course of an assignment to photograph her for a beer advertisement that um, Kajima first met Ponta and they fell in love. Um, of course, Kajima was still married. Um, in fact, his, his, his status as the head of the Kajima family was dependent on his marriage to, to Nobuko. Um, what we're watching in this photograph is very much an affair taking place in real time um, with photographic evidence. Um, great for the law courts. Um, and uh, the divorce did... Well, actually, it was a rather clean divorce, but anyway, this is a prevailing theme in Kajima's work, his obsession with Ponta. Um, not only was she his mistress, but she was also his muse, and Kajima photographed her. Uh, she appears... She's very much a dominant figure in his portfolio. Um, this is a very striking portrait, uh, which rather challenges... Um, 
perhaps a rather stereotypical image we have of um, female portraiture from your garden of photography. And here she is, Ponta, shown gazing through a broken shorty screen. Um, what on <coughs> earth is going on here? Um, her hair is down, which is extremely, it is eroticised. Um, it's highly likely that um, Kajima was inspired by, there was a geisha from the, I think it was the Shinbashi quarter in Tokyo by the name of Oz Oz Ozuma, who um, was photographed with her hair undressed. Her story was that she arrived, she was late for her appointment at the photographic studio, she had to get a portrait taken uh, for, to distribute among her clients. She was late for her appointment, she just washed her hair, she didn't have time to dry her hair in the jinrikisha journey over to the studio. She arrived at the studio with wet hair and had herself photographed with it hanging down and distributed the image um, and it became a best-selling image. It established her reputation, um, she was savvy enough to get a cut of the proceeds from the photograph and was able to buy her freedom and um, start a new life. Um, this story may well have inspired Kajima to apply his own spin to this, this it was a sub-genre which was created by Otsuma, the so-called um, the Araigami, the washed hair, and it became a look. Women actually, um, try, they, they, they experimented with, with letting their hair down, in the sense of, literal sense, and, um, and having this slight wet look, and here we have Ponta, um, sort of in, 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 not only in that style, but also in a very strange pose, directing her gaze off camera, um, sort of slightly um, thoughtful expression. Um, this is very much the standard of Meiji period beauty. Ponta represented the, the idealised um, melon face, the Urizane Gao, which was very popular at that time, and her button nose. Um, she was considered a great beauty um, of, of her day. Um, and she was also 15 years old, but that's a different story, which I won't go into. Um, Kajima's um, obsession manifests itself in other ways. Um, this was an image which I found and was very happy to sell, because I knew it was going to a good home. In fact, it was the Kurokawa collection. Um, at first sight, it was a rather typical image uh, generated by so many studios of geisha in a sort of uh, in a, a simulated flower garden. Um, however, if you look carefully, I guess the first clue is that there is a slight, a slightly fuzzy line going down the middle vertically, which indicates that this is a double exposure. And of course it's the same woman, it's Ponta who's been photographed twice. So she's been photographed initially, it seems, in this rather sober outfit on the right. Um, the left hand side is, is left covered so that it can be taken afterwards. Um, she then does a quick change of costume and is then um, photographed um, actually in a different kind of kimono with longer sleeves indicating that she's a young girl. Um, there seems to be this sort of this dual identity she has as both a, a sort of matronly figure and as a, an attractive young girl. Um, and there are numerous examples of, of uh, Kajima's playfulness um, with Ponta but also with other geisha and um, he seems to have been, despite being married, he ma eventually married uh, Ponta, um, despite being married to her, he still seems to have been quite a patron of the geisha world. Um, um, and he called on geisha quite often to serve as models, uh, a lot of his portfolio. And we ha we're lucky enough to have a surviving um, list, a catalogue um, of, of the studio's uh, photographs. Uh, unfortunately, it's only text, but the titles on their own are enough to, to get um, uh, specialists in photography quite excited. Um, this is another image, I think, which represents Kajima's playfulness. Um, it's, at first blush, it's, it's a, a nicely constructed image of um, five, five young ladies with, um, with casa, with, with, um, with umbrellas. Um, the English caption doesn't tell us much. There's the number of the negative in the stock, and then girls holding umbrellas. And um, it's interesting that they seem to direct their gazes in different directions. Um, there's a slight, there's something rather watchful going on here. Um, you might also notice that the the inscription on the umbrella on the umbrellas is identical. Um, the sharp-eyed among you might have already read it. It reads as. Um, Shira Nami. 
which would probably have meant absolutely nothing to Kajima's foreign clientele, but to his Japanese clientele, it would have had immediate resonance connecting them to this kabuki drama from 1862, uh, Inasegawa Seizo Roi no Ba, um, which is a very, um, a very sort of dramatic um, piece um, revolving around the so-called the, the Five Thieves, the um, Shiranami Otoko Gonin, and it basically follows their adventures across Edo as they are pursued by the authorities, and then the climactic scene comes when they are finally cornered at a shrine and there is no escape, and each of them delivers a monologue describing their exploits and basically how great they are. And um, the, um, the authorities, the, the, the constables, are, are so in awe of them by the end of after hearing these five monologues, that they, their guard is completely down and they're able to make their escape. And so this earlier image is a sort of uh, a parody, a, a mitate of uh, a kabuki drama which would be still, it was still playing at this time in the 1890s. So this is something which um, it shows that um, we shouldn't regard these images as aimed exclusively at foreigners, um, but that there was also a Japanese clientele for them. And there's a similar element here, uh, where it's not the Shiranami Otoko Gonin, but it's um, actually, if you can, you can see from the inscription on the back, um, on the parasols, um, it's um, Yanagibashi, one of the main geisha quarter in Tokyo. And it seems uh, that um, Kajima was unable to let go of the kabuki theme, and um, he deployed, he actually recruited five geisha from um, from the um, the Yanagibashi quarter to pose for him uh, in a slightly more restrained uh, enactment of the scene, but nevertheless it it would be familiar to any Japanese customer looking at this image. Um, certainly the geisha would be familiar, but also the the the, 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 the connection with with that drama and the Shiranami Gomi uh, Um The connection with um, kabuki manifests in itself in this. Um, rather dramatic exploit of Kajimo's. And it's, it's always, with Kajimo, it's always a dramatic exploit, almost designed to grab headlines. And um, this is photographing um, Ichikawa Danjiro, the doyen of Kabuki theatre, in one of his, well, one of his <coughs> best-known roles, the Shibaraku. Um, and this was photographed inside the Kabuki Tsar in November 1895. And this was done with the cooperation of the, um, of the, of the, um, the owners of the theatre. And it involved, um, you can see, three glowing spheres. These were the arc lights which were, low, which were, which were uh, installed so that a photograph could be taken of, um, of Ichikawa Danjo in this role, something which had never been done before. And there was a further sitting uh, which involved, and sadly we haven't actually found the photograph, um, this is... This is an example of the kind of portrait which um, Kajimo was taking of Ichikawa, a um, very sort of reverential um, portrait. Um, and it was the largest photograph which Kajimo had ever taken. And just to give you an idea of scale, and again I emphasize this is not, probably not the actual photograph. We, we don't know what it looks like, but we do know it was of uh, Ichikawa Danjiro. And it was described as life-size, and we have the dimensions and the dimensions of the photograph are 91 centimetres by um, 1.12 metres. And in order for this to be taken, Kajima had to order a, um, a glass plate to be made. Um, a dry plate negative had to be ordered from the Marion Company in London. And Kajima was very fond of telling his friends back in Tokyo that there was this exchange of telegrams between London and Tokyo um, as the panicked... Um, manufacturers in London say, are you absolutely sure this is the size you want? Because we've never actually made one this size. And Kajima would say, no, no, that's the size, please make it. And um, the negative was finally delivered, unbroken, and this was taken. And this sort of fits in with um, Kajima's obsession with, um, with size. And, and also, I think, with technology, because um, the Marin Company was one of the leading companies um, of the dry plate. And the dry plate is very closely connected. It is the, the next step in 19th century photography. Uh, when you're, you have a, a 
uh, a process which is a lot less cumbersome and which enables you to photograph um, um, instantaneous movement. Uh, previously, with the wet plate, instantaneous movement was, was difficult. Uh, you would always get a, a, a blur, sometimes you would get ghosts where people were moving in the landscape and the exposure was just too long to capture them. So, Kajima was very, a, a very keen proponent of the dry plate, which um, brings us to another aspect of um, Kajima's career, which I think challenges our, perhaps our conventional perspective on Yokohama photography, that it was always a case of Japanese photographers apprenticing themselves to um, foreign photographers, learning the trade. It's always very much a, a master and pupil relationship, which then develops into a well, a, a relationship based on rivalry, as the, um, the pupil learns all he needs to know, establishes his own studio, and then starts to undercut his former master, either financially, in terms of price, or just, uh, just eclipsing him in terms of um, publicity. And um, this brings us to a very charismatic figure. Um, I was reminded of him as, as I was coming here today, walking past the Sherlock Holmes Museum, because... William Kinnaman Burton is one of those wonderful figures from the late 19th century, a very close friend of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Um, he was a sanitary engineer. Um, he was probably the most famous amateur photographer of his day. Um, he was a Fabian socialist, um, pipe smoker, beer drinker, um, all-round ace bloke. And he um, came to Japan in 1886 as um, an employee of the Japanese government. Uh, his day job was to advise on uh, water supply, uh, water supply and the disposal of sewage. So um, it, it was a pretty demanding job, and he had the uh, he had a very good position at Tokyo Imperial University as professor of sanitary engineering. Um, he was away on various projects, not only in Japan but also in Taiwan, which became part of the Japanese Empire in 1895. Um, and when he wasn't um, ensuring that the, there was a plentiful supply of water and making sure that the, 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 the drains ran on time. Um, he was, um, uh, he was uh, an advocate of photography, uh, of amateur photography, of um, the new advances in photography. And he was extremely well placed to act as a sort of a filter for information on the latest technical advances in, in, in Europe and America and um, pass them on to um, a growing community of Japanese photographers, both amateur and professional. And um, here is Burton sharing a joke with a friend, um, the sumo wrestler Otsutsu Maneemon, who later became a, um, a um, what's the rank I'm looking for, the top sumo rank? That's the one. Um, he was a, yes, future champion. Um, he was called, basically Kajima and Burton got on like a house on fire. Um, and um, they started organising these photographic, um, well, they, they, they went off on photographic expeditions together, but they also organised photographic sessions. And um, this is a part of a, a portfolio of photographs which was created by um, Kajima and Burton in collaboration, um, trying out the dry plate process. And this was done, this, this was done in, in midsummer in 1890. You can see um, uh, Burton is stripped down to his shirt sleeves, uh, striking a rather confident pose. He's conscious of the figure towering next to him. And through Kajima's connections, uh, they were able to call some pretty high-ranking sumo wrestlers to the Burton residence, which is in, um, well, uh, close to the present-day Hongo campus in, in central Tokyo. And um, the sumo wrestlers duly arrived with, their, with an umpire. And again, the umpire is, uh, this is an hereditary position, I... Um, the, 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 there are only two senior umpire, and the position is passed on, not from father to son, but from master to apprentice. So we have a high-ranking umpire with um, a, at least one rising star of the sumo scene and one established, um, I don't think he was a, I think it was Nozaki. But anyway, the, the idea was to demonstrate how you could capture movement with uh, dry plates. And so on one side you have Burton with his camera taking... Uh, photographs of these wrestlers as they go through their paces. You have uh, Burton, uh, sorry, Kajima, standing behind. You can see him with his his tripod camera, and uh, at least one of his assistants standing with a plate holder. And um, on the other side, 
you have Kajima directing his camera. Um, well, he's capturing this particular hold or grapple. I'm, I'm not or fair with the language of sumo. And uh, you can just make out Burton behind, um, about to take off the lens cap uh, to get his shot. And this portfolio sort of, uh, it was designed to give um, people an idea of uh, sumo practice. Uh, it was the first time this had ever been done. And so it's a combination of uh, Burton's knowledge of um, photography, modern photography, of uh, Kajima's um, extensive network of connections. If you're a sake distributor in Japan, you know a lot of people, mm -hmm. and especially with the world of sumo, because sake is so central mm -hmm. to the ritual, but also um, product placement. Uh, and this portfolio was issued in colotype form as a photo book, marking a... It was published under Burton's name, though in the introduction, Burton is very clear that this is a joint venture between him and Kajima. And uh, this is a very rare album. Um, there was a copy in the Japan Society, but I think it was sold at Sotheby's last year, and um, I don't know where it is now. Um, but this sort of memorialises their, um, their partnership, but it also shows the future direction of photography, that um, the future lies perhaps not so much in producing um, images on photographic paper, but of producing images uh, in book form, um, especially in a, a process which is as artisanal as the, the colotype process. And this is part and parcel of um, a sense of um, collaboration um, between Japanese and foreign photographers. Um, Burton and um, Kajima both played a formative role in putting together um, a very influential exhibition in 1893, um, which was described as the uh, Gaikoku Shashin Tenrankai, the Exhibition of Foreign Photographs. And this was a loan exhibition from the, well, it started as uh, a loan exhibition from the London Camera Club. And um, they put together um, basically a sample, a sampling of about less, just under 300 um, photographs, which were examples of artistic photography as it was being practiced in Europe at that time. And so you get some very interesting names in the list of exhibits. Um, uh, people like uh, Henry Peach Robinson um, or uh, Frank Meadows Sutcliffe, pioneers of artistic photography. There are some other surprises like Ju Julia Margaret Cameron from a previous generation, um, probably the closest thing we have to a pre-Raphaelite photographer. Her work appeared in Tokyo in 1893, which um, I always enjoy surprising my Japanese friends with, because the conventional wisdom is that Julia Margaret Cameron was unknown until the 1980s. Um, these, sadly, we don't know too much about the exhibits. We have these half-tone uh, reproductions of the actual exhibition in progress, and you can see um, that it was a pretty extensive show, and newspaper reports at that time describe crowds of Japanese um, photographers, amateurs, professionals, um, going along to look at this exhibition not once but several times and being bowled over by what they saw. And, and I like to think Kajima played, well he was already playing his conventional role of bankroller or money man, I, think he, I like to think he played an additional role in securing a visit from the Meiji Empress, who just happened to be passing or, well, she was visiting a, an exhibition nearby, but was allowed herself to be persuaded to come in and have a look at this exhibition of foreign photographs, something which at that time was unheard of, the idea of, idea of imperial, public imperial patronage of photography. Um, so we have this sort of wonderful, it is a collaboration between foreign and uh, Japanese photographers, um, which is how I, would like your, how I would like to think of Yokohama photography ending. Um, as far as Kajima's career is in, goes, I always like to end with a question which uh, historians really shouldn't ask, but it's too tempting to ignore, and that is, what if? And in Kajima's case, the question is, what if, what if his relationship with his family had not soured to the extent that in March 1896 he was struck off the family register um, and he was deposed as head of the Kajima fortune. Admittedly, he was given a fairly good severance deal, 
Um, the divorce was clean. He was given a monthly stipend, and he was allowed to carry on doing what he did. But um, his connection with the Kajima family was completely severed. Um, Kajima was so used to extravagance, he could not um, rein in his... Um, he could not basically make his gross habits match his net income. And um, <laughs> eventually he ran out of money. In 1899, the studio, the Gen Rokukan, had to be sold on. Um, Kajima managed to stagger on. Um, he moved to, um, to Kansai, where he tried to set up a photomechanical printing business. That seems to have failed. Then he had an accident with some magnesium flash powder and lost his thumb on his right hand. Um, that seems to have demoralized him, and he gave up photography completely um, and fell back on one of the hobbies he picked up in his sort of dissolute youth of um, playing the flute in the No Theatre. And he devoted the rest of his life to uh, playing in No Dramas. And um, he and Ponta lived in genteel poverty. Their lives became the matter of public, well, rather purient public interest. The newspapers would occasionally re publish reports of how reduced their circumstances were, uh, especially in Ponta's case. I, I quote a rather spicy, rather uncomplimentary report in the, in the handout. And um, Eventually, um, and the, rule, the story is that um, Kajima was preparing himself uh, for one particular performance which required him to play the um, part of a, an old man uh, who was slowly dying of a debilitating <coughs> disease. So he began to starve himself for the role. And uh, this is in 1924, and apparently he was so successful that after actually performing this, um, he died uh, several weeks later from having starved himself. And um, Ponta died shortly afterwards, so their story ends there. But had he lived, he would have perhaps played a larger role in perhaps the diffusion of uh, photography across Japan. We could also ask that about Burton, because Burton was extremely active as a, a, a sort of a, a, an evangelical figure, almost. But um, his career, he was a victim of his own success. His work as a sanitary engineer in mainland Japan was so successful, he, he was sent to Taiwan. He administered um, the, the water supply there, seems to have contracted fever, and being Burton, he overworked. And so he managed to get secure leave in 1899, um, returned to Tokyo, was due to return to Scotland, and sadly died from overwork. And again, if Burton had lived longer, his impact on Japanese photography would certainly be greater. So we're presented with perhaps an alternative view of, um, of um, how uh, photography would have changed from the end of your path of photography as it ended a period of artistic photography. Um, I'm well aware that I'm close to the limit, time limit, so I will end here. But thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> thank you very much.